How's it going everybody and welcome to another Lumix Live. This week we are having another one of our ambassador spotlights with our US ambassador Ben Grinnell. And uh, this is this is going to be a really exciting one. Uh, ben is one of the photographers that works here with us in the United States. And uh, if you've seen his work before with a lot of the landscapes and astro work, you may know why I'm super excited about this. But uh, in a few minutes, we will be uh, bringing uh, Ben onto the stream with us here. But we're going to get some uh, housekeeping out of the way and uh, uh, kind of get you guys ready for this. So. Um, just to give a heads up, we are not announcing anything on this stream. Uh, there's no product uh, announcements or anything like that. So if you guys have questions about that, you can still feel free to drop uh, you know, your questions and your comments about uh, equipment and what's coming, uh, like what, what you guys want to see. Uh, unfortunately, we just don't have any information about that. Uh, you'll see streams about that kind of stuff separate when, when and if we do them on this kind of platform. But um, for those that are new to the Lumix Live uh, setup, uh, again, welcome for those that are new, welcome to those that have joined us before. If you have questions for myself or for Ben during the stream, drop them in the chat uh, either below or to the side, depending on which platform you are viewing this on. Uh, and make sure to tag Lumix cameras in that so that I will see it pop up on my end here and we can address the uh, question live. Uh, we are covering a lot about you know Ben's photography and you know who he is, what he does. So if you have questions specifically for Ben, make sure to drop those in there as well. Uh, we want to use this as a way to give you guys a ton of information about photography, give you guys a peek behind the curtain as to you know what makes Ben click, uh, and you know kind of go from there. So with that, let's uh, let's bring Ben in here. So uh, hey Ben, how are you? Hey, what's going on, Sean? How are you? <laughs> <laughs> doing doing pretty good pretty good so um, you know just like I was saying I'm, I'm, I'm really excited that that you know we get to, to do this stream here um, it's been a while since you and I really had a long conversation you know I think it was at least a year ago uh, during one of our actual Lumix team meetings but uh, I how about you give everyone who's joined on kind of a background as to who you are what got you into photography and uh, we'll start there well, first, thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Um, yeah. How did I get into photography? Well, that's, it's kind of a long story. I mean, I guess it all started out, I wanted to be a professional skier when I was younger. Um, I was super into the freestyle skiing scene and like, wait a minute, like I need to figure out how to use a camera so that when I'm with somebody, I can show them how to use the camera. <laughs> So that they can take pictures or so on and so forth so that I can like actually have documentation to like move my career forward. Um, so when I was like 14, 15, I like picked up a camera by myself, you know, and then and I was like, okay, like I need more help. So I went to a vocational school for like multimedia graphic design. And my teacher there like had no clue what was going on whatsoever. She knew how to use a camera. She was a cabbage farmer and like made kimchi. <laughs> and basically was like, okay, so just do like Photoshop tutorials and like we've got a dark room, so play with the dark room. And that kind of like, you know, I didn't really think about it until later in life that that like kind of shaped me to learn the camera correctly, you know. Um, and then I went along with my ski career and skied for a while. And I was actually born in Switzerland and my pops lives there, like most of my family lives there. So... Nowadays, I go back, try to go back twice a year. Obviously, not right now. Um, <laughs> but that being said, like, I was always like, you know, I, I gotta, like, I really gotta start figuring out how to, like, take pictures in Switzerland here because, like, all I do is tell everybody how beautiful it is there. Like, and I, I, like, I need to show them, like, you know, pretty much, like, what I'm seeing. And, like, they're like, oh, well, I've been out west and I've been here. And I'm like, well, that's cool, but, like, I've been there too, but, like, you know, and maybe it's just because I'm born there too, but like I really wanted to share that place with everybody I knew, you know? Yeah. Um, so that being said, I like, was like, okay, like, how do I figure out how to like, you know, this is like when HDR first started coming out. And, like, and I was a little, I was a little into it, but I was like a little bit like, that's kind of overblown as well. And uh, so I wanted to figure, you know, I learned about the eye and, you know, how our brains compute, how quickly, like, you know, our eyes F, 
2.2 to 1.7, you know, but like our brain is so fast that it like computes it into this focus stacked image that we see. So that, that like kind of pushed me along and then, you know, I hurt myself skiing, you know, when I was like in my early 20s and then I was like, well, I'm going to still work in the ski and snowboard industry and I'm going to like, you know, work for different brands and be like, hey, like, I know everybody in the ski industry, I'll build you a team of athletes, I'll take all your photos, I'll take all your video, and it's like a one-stop package, you know? And then from there, it's like basically like, okay, like, what else can I do, you know? Like, I, I wanna, I, I'm sick of the ski industry, like, for me, like, sharing, like, beautiful places is, like, more important to me, so, like, I kind of morphed it into landscape photography and nature photography and when I started taking pictures at night, it was just like a whole nother world for me, so. Huh, yeah. No, that's, that's, that's like such a cool way to go, like, like go from, you know, not, not, not being in photography to finding a way to, to make it work for your, your style and stuff. So that's, that's, that's definitely a really cool way to see it. Hopefully for those in the chat, um, hopefully the audio is a little bit better now. Um, tweak things around a bit. Uh, we're always always having fun with the way audio comes through on some of these things. So uh, if everything looks cool, um, cool. So uh, <laughs> so with with the um, you know kind of getting into it, what what kind of um, you know over time, how how has your photography kind of evolved? You know, from utilitarian to kind of like the the style that you that that you just enjoy like has has a lot of that changed over the time for you it has changed i mean like you know i do a lot of product photography i do i'm now a real estate agent so i do a lot of real estate photography uh but you know like to me my passion is always in astrophotography my i mean my i'm an outdoors person you know like i absolutely love hiking i love getting into the middle of nowhere and I do see a lot of like, you know, there's a lot of famous photographers that I look up to as well. But like, I, I'm not really trying to go to Horseshoe Bend and take the Horseshoe Bend shot. Like, it's <laughs> like, it's not for me, you know, like, yeah. sure, I'd love, I'd, I'd stop if I was in this in the area, maybe take a shot. I, I just probably wouldn't, you know, it, it wouldn't. What's meaningfully for me is like, basically, like, you know, getting out into the middle of nowhere and like, you know, sharing what I see that's like different if I can you know yeah yeah that's 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 one of the things that I think a lot of a lot of photographers may fall into the trap of I know for the longest time I did where it's you know you see you see those images that are like so iconic you know Ansel Adams and and stuff like that like like what you're taught while growing up and and you always try to to mimic it but finding your style and your your vision of of what you want to create i think is 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 such a cool thing once you get comfortable enough in it and i from from my point of view the images that that you produce very clearly show that i mean you know getting into astrophotography personally seeing your work whether it's you know here in the u.s or uh you know overseas it's 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 so cool seeing a lot of these places in 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 different ways that you know most people never really experience most people haven't experienced so with with your astrophotography um because i want to kind of focus a bit on on some of that because i know you also have some images to to you know share with everyone here um what would you say uh is is kind of your workflow when you're getting ready to go out and capture some of these images well so a lot of planning goes into like all sorts of astrophotography and i mean you could do it simply driving to a spot you know like you've got your car full of your camera gear and you know obviously your tripod because if that camera moves you know <laughs> you're gonna get not gonna get a tack sharp image but so what i like to do is like i'm usually like okay like so how many days am I going to go out for? And, it, and it's something that I, when I find a spot, it's either half the time it's like, okay, like I've already planned this spot out to go shoot at. And then like, I end up finding 10 times things better in the dark. Um, 
But like, you know, it's like it, it, you're preparing your tent, you're preparing food for a few days, you know, there's something called water that like, is important to, to drink, like to, you know, Wait, continue is. on when you have energy. So like when I do plan, I, you know, make sure I have obviously battery and like multiple headlamps because light painting is something that I really enjoy to do as well. But like packing light is super important. And, you know, when I, I usually bring two camera bodies, you know, I usually bring like a micro four thirds body and like a full frame body. And I almost stick to one lens on each camera just cause I gotta have room for food. I gotta have room for my sleeping bag, you know. Yeah. And of course, water is very important as well. <laughs> So which, uh, you know, to, since obviously this is a Lumix live stream, which, uh, which um, uh, cameras are, are you currently, you know, kind of favoring in, in your use? So for astrophotography, I'm like, I can crank my ISO to, you know, 15,000, 20,000 now with the new S1. So like, I'm, I've been kind of stuck on that for, for quite a while right now, but. Um, I do, I do use the G9 a lot with like the 12 mil that we have that, and then I also use the GH5S, you know, it's like super lightweight and like you, the ISO is insane on it. And it, it's, so that's like usually one camera I'll set up basically for a time lapse or something like that, a set it and forget it camera, get the settings right, you know, set up the in-camera time lapse mode and like leave that camera and then like you know, go run around somewhere differently and then take separate single exposures. But yeah, no, that's, 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 that's such a cool, like kind of setup, you know, having, having the different tools for the different part of what it is you want to create. And I mean, from, from someone who lightly enjoys going camping, like it, I, I, I do like going camping, but I'm definitely more of a city person, you know, having that, that ability to jump to a GH5S and then my S1 or my S1R, it's like, it, it's, it's cool that it's all one ecosystem and the menus are the same and, you know, it, it, it doesn't get in the way of when you're actually out in the field focusing on creating instead of, you know, what camera setting do I need to have this set up? Now, I know we're going to, there's, there's got to be questions out there about, you know, what, in, in fact, here's one from Glenn, which is uh, on the S series, which is your current favorite um, lens that you're using for this time. Uh, right now I am using this a Sigma lens right now, but I have been using that 16 to 35 as well too for the night scene. Um, that 50 mil is, is good, but I, I love shooting wide, you know, like I'm, I just, I, I'm usually like super wide or super zoom. So, yeah. Um, yeah. But I do, right currently I have the, the Sigma art 20 mil on there, which, you know, we are kind of collabed with. And then other than that, I'm always usually, usually using the 1635. Nice. Yeah. 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 That's, 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 I think kind of the cool thing too, with, with the L mount is that, you know, you have that compatibility between, uh, Leica, Sigma and Panasonic for the optics. If we don't make one, Sigma makes one or Leica makes one. And, uh, you know, it's, really? it's, it's cool seeing it. It's an array of all different, you know, how, however you like to shoot too, you know, like, cause some people are very stuck in what lens they want. And as we develop more lenses too, the, you know, the sky's the limit. But. Yeah, definitely. Uh, so a question from Mark, uh, in the micro four thirds platform, which would you say is your favorite, uh, lens for astrophotography? That 12 mil 1.4. It's definitely, yeah, that's, that's the go-to. Yeah, so so Mark, there's the uh, 12 millimeter 1.4 Sumalux that uh, is the collaborative lens with Leica. Uh, it is from day one. I actually remember when we launched that. It was it was targeting a lot of this style of photography. It's well corrected in the corners. It's a fast bright aperture, and it, it's relatively small too. I mean, on on a G9, I think it's it's one of those you know really well suited lenses for that platform. And then I mean also. There's that 17 1.5 is pretty, pretty nice. Too. Yeah. Yeah. 15 <laughs> 1.7. <laughs> so, um, I, I, I know you have some images to show. Uh, we've been talking a lot about, you know, the Astro images. You want to jump over and, uh, show us some of those, uh, some of those yeah. shots. 
Yeah, I mean, I've got some mixed landscapes. I'm super into landscapes as well. So, you know, if you have any questions or anybody has any questions, please ask away. Yeah. Uh, so while, while you're doing that, um, Glenn has a, another question here. Um, when you're shooting with that 12, are you shooting it wide open or do you stop it down? It depends on if I'm like light painting or not. So I do like to focus stack as well. So like, you know, I'll stop it down if I'm going to change the focus for the foreground. And then you, I mean, sometimes I'm at, I find the sweet spot of that lens is almost 1.8 um, for, you know, your infinity background starscape basically. Yeah. Cool. So Just because it's, that, that much easier to get the stars tack in focus, you know. Yeah. And like like this image here is like a you know it's it's focus stack so separate exposure for the rear and an, and then a light painting in the front. Yeah. So that's 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 one of the things I think um, you know for for those interested in doing astrophotography I know you've taught some classes on it before um, in person when when we were actually able to be in stores. Um, yeah, <laughs> this is such a fun aspect of photography, but it's also, in my opinion, it's also one of the more demanding styles you know, because of all yeah, that preparation you have to do. Totally. And, you know, and, and there's a big thought process that goes into it. And I mean, like there's tons of apps you can use, too. So another thing that like really comes into play is like light pollution. You know, I mean, if you're close to a city, like you're going to get this glow haze of basically any sort of city light or even a town light that's involved from anywhere in the distance. Like there's a website called like, there's tons of them, but like dark site finder is basically yep. a website that I use. And like, when I know I'm traveling somewhere, I'll check out the light pollution. And then, you know, there's tons of apps to know where you're shooting. You know, you got to think about the moon cycle. Cause if the moon's out, you're not going to be able to see the stars as much, but you know, maybe that leaves for a separate cooler image anyways. Um, so there's tons of things to basically consider when you're planning to go out to shoot night photography, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, so this, this, this image, you, you, um, you know, you were saying that you, you do a lot of travel. I know from the conversations you and I have had, um, specifically actually back when we were launching that, uh, the eight to 18 for the G series, I know you went and traveled around to shoot with that lens. Um, what what kind of you know lenses do you use for shots like this? Is this ultra wide and cropped this, or this is actually on the twenty four one oh five uh when I like first really got my hands on the, the S one R, which like, you know, it's my it's it's the camera I carry all the time, basically. Uh, <laughs> I do I do like I do like the more megapixels. I do like the more detail, um, and I do like to be able to crop if I want to crop. But, uh, but yeah, this is this is out in Alabama Hills in California, and I think I think I actually saw you right after. Last time I saw you was right after I'd taken some of these images or this images especially. But. Oh yeah, that's right. Yeah. <laughs> Man, time time flies when it's like, you know, when when was the last time we we're actually out and able to see each other? But yeah, so totally. like 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 this image. This I I I love the images that that you make where you have that that really kind of, you know, captivating foreground that, you know, is 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 really sharp, nice and detailed and then just these gorgeous landscapes in in the background. Yeah, so like so this this image is like auto bracketed and focus stacks and you can actually focus stack in the cameras. I, I prefer to do it, you know, manually afterwards. Um, so this is shot with the eight to 18 and I think the G nine actually. And, uh, yeah, so basically, you know, separate exposures, separate focal focus points, um, for the background, the foreground, and then, you know, manually blending them together in Photoshop. <laughs> Uh, let's see. So uh, we've got some other questions too here. One from Mark. Um, <clears throat> do you have any advice for photographers? Since you mentioned, you know, setting up some time lapse. Um, do you have any uh, advice for photographers to do night to day time lapse shooting? 
Yeah, so, well, in our new cameras, we do have almost a sort of ramping mode. Um, but you basically, I mean, as you know as well, the camera needs to ramp the ISO up and down to be able to deal with that much exchange of light, you know, because when we're going from day neutral to dark night. <laughs> um, so we do have a new mode built in, and I played with it a little bit, but, like, it's, I think those promote systems, which I haven't used in a couple years, but like that will basically really be able to, you know, ramp the, the camera's ISO or however you're going to actually change from dark to night. Um, that, you know, that much light change basically. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's definitely like one of those, one of those kind of like, like pinnacle types of, of time lapses is, is nailing that that transition from night to day and day to night um totally. <laughs> let's see uh glenn and says but, uh, yep. you know, we're not talking that much you know exposure change i mean obviously clouds and stuff like that like being on shutter priority is pretty nice too and you know yeah because that way we may get the actual change in clouds and light and stuff like that without like having flicker and crazy stuff like that <laughs> yeah yeah i i know um i've i've been using uh oh man just as like i said there's there's a lot of things out there that that support this style of photography both like for the astro work and for time lapse um i know i've been using i've looked at some of the promote stuff uh i think i've, I've been using time lapse plus the software yeah. plugin side of it for lightroom recently which again you know for for uh, Mark's question, you know, like with with the advice into it, it's really being able to to control a lot of your base exposures and understanding all of that, and really working in what tool is going to provide the settings that you need for it. The exposure leveling that the S series cameras have in it is is a good base to start with and then you'll see that there are certain circumstances where you do want to expand it to like that next level of equipment because it is an entire you know kind of dedication to that style of photography and and videography at that point totally the day and tonight there's such a harsh change of multiple settings that would have to be changed inside the camera and something's got to tell that camera without touching it so. <laughs> yeah 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 so this is cool. Um, where where is uh, where's this shot taken? Uh, this is this is in Grindelwald, Switzerland. This is like my hometown, so to say. <laughs> and uh, like, just you know, I, I love Edelweiss. These are Edelweiss in the foreground, and there just happened to be a very cooperative frog. You know, so <laughs> like, it's a composite image because it's a, it's a focus stacked foreground and a focus stacked background but like that's all that was all there and real you know yeah <laughs> so when, and, when you know, so separate exposure and settings you know for the foreground of the the flowers and the frog and then you know switching the settings without moving the camera much at all you know via the the image app or barely bumping and touching your camera to to basically change settings and focus for the background <laughs> yeah you know and and that's that's honestly i think one of the cooler things and, and what draws me so much to a lot of your images like this is that it's easy to see people that do you know these kind of composite images where it's a totally different sky put behind that background because either yeah. maybe the milky way wasn't coming up over the mountains or you know in certain cases uh like i've seen commented like what uh, glenn's mentioning where light pollution might be a challenge for people to create images like that your images are are the realest you can get for that type of shooting you know it's it's understanding your equipment and actually showing what that view looks like if you were to stand there and and look at the sky um, totally and that's I mean, i'm just always trying to share you know for me i think my images are are for me it's like it takes me right back to the moment that i was there and how i was feeling and all that sort of stuff and, and i like to share you know real moments basically you know and and share the beauty of like what i've gotten to see you know yeah so with with the um, the um, 
foreground parts there, what what kind of lights are you using for the light painting? Are you using flash, uh, just LED lamps? No, that, that's just my headlamp. I've got like a couple different black diamond headlamps with a couple different lumen settings. And, you know, I literally just every time, it depends on if I'm going for, you know, warm or cool or whatnot. And, uh, you know, it's, it's taken a lot of trial and error, but you know, I reshoot until I feel like I have it perfectly correct. And then, you know, there's variables like the wind or like the frog jumping away and, you know, all sorts of different things to like, make sure you get right so that, you know, you can move on and feel like you definitely have a, you know, I can't tell you how many images I've taken and thought I had it right, got home with the computer and was like, oh, that's not. Uh, you know, <laughs> it's like, well, well, there goes all that time. Yeah, and I do like to like almost quickly flash both sides of the scene, so it does give it some dimension as well. Um, almost like fake lighting, but like in a you know, like in a if you're in a studio and you've got lights on both sides, and you know, you're really trying to accentuate you know what your eye goes to, or you know, portrait photography. It, I kind of try to bring that aspect in with my headlamp, you know, and and there's a million different ways to light paint. And like, it's just like, it's really, it's like a fun, it's a, once you get the hang of like setting your camera to infinity, which now obviously is just super easy in all of our cameras because we have a night mode and, you know, um, the hardest thing I, I've had to teach people is how to find infinity, but you know, now with technology advances and our camera systems, finding infinity isn't the problem anymore, especially with focus speaking. So um, that hard work of it all is kind of out the door, uh, which is great, you know, that's what technology should be doing, but. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, I, you know, I, I, I always think about the, the images like this when people were doing them on film, it's like, just just the process of how you used to have to composite on film versus what modern technology now really assists right. in, in getting out of your way as long as you understand the equipment. And I think that's yeah. that's a big point for a lot of people too is, you know, really understand your equipment before, you know, you dive, you know, headfirst into some of these more extreme styles. Because like you said... You know, for, for for this shot, I can't imagine this was easy to get up to, you know, to, to spend the day, plan, get up there, spend the time shooting. That's that's a lot well, I mean, of consideration. I mean, f forget all that. Just like finding Edelweiss growing naturally on the Alp is like just <laughs> one of the hardest elements that there is. Mind all the crazy other stuff that went into this <laughs> image. <laughs> but, um, <laughs> And, you know, it took like a good half hour of getting it right with the frog and so on and so forth, but. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, that's cool, yeah. Um, and this is over in Iceland. Nice. So uh, just a reminder, for those watching the stream, if you have questions for Ben about the, the work that he's doing, how he captured an image, um, if you want to know what lens, things like that, drop it in the comments. Um, we want you guys to be able to use this as an opportunity to learn from as well. Um, I know I've, I've spent a lot of time learning and watching and, and you know, trying to understand what, what Ben puts into, into some of these images and, and it all helps you know, kind of grow all of our, our experiences in this. So, uh, so th this, this image you said was in Iceland? Yep. And so, like, you know, Iceland's very cliche, like, like, oh, my gosh, everybody goes to Iceland, takes a picture of the same waterfall. But, like, it, you could go there a hundred times and every single off the beaten path around the corner, there is just, you know, and I'm not like, I don't work for Iceland or anything like that. But <laughs> same thing, Iceland, same thing with Iceland Iceland, travel like, hero. Like, I was born in Switzerland and, like, my family lives there. My dad was a mountain guide there. He shows me, like... He's always like, oh, have you been to this spot that's like literally 15 minutes away? And, you know, I've spent, I, I go there twice a year and I'm always like, what? This is right here? And it's this, I feel like it's the same thing with Iceland. Um, yeah, they've got all these like attractions on the list, but, you know, this, 
this whole glacier isn't on the map as like an attraction or anything like that. And, you know, obviously, if, obviously being respectful of the land is like the most important thing anywhere you go, or for me at least. So um, taking that into consideration, you, you can really go around any corner and see absolutely amazingly beautiful stuff that people don't commonly shoot. Yeah. So we've, we've, we've gotten a, a couple questions in here. So, um, cool. one of the questions from, uh, David, uh, for the Iceland shot, uh, what time of day or night, uh, was the shot taken? So this is sunset and, uh, I, I set the camera to auto bracket. I do auto bracket a lot. Um, you know, I tend to only use one or two images or will only even use one image, but this was shot, you know, at sunset, the sun was just about to like really go into golden hour. And I used two separate exposures, you know, it's almost like I'm trying to future proof my images by, you know, oh, I wish I had overexposed this one area that, you know, is too dark or, you know, once it's blown out, it's blown out. So we know that photography, so. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> I, that's why I do yeah. auto bracket, and it does. You know, I've got piles of hard drives all around here, but that that's that's fine. <laughs> <laughs> Let's see. We got a, a, another question here from Ashok. Uh, mostly shooting dusk or dawn. Um, so, you, wow, I I totally just like stared at a bunch of text, and like my brain just went. Don't know what any of those words are. <laughs> so, says, um, so Ben, are you mostly shooting at dusk or dawn for getting some of the light in the foreground of the landscapes? I, I, I think you kind of uh, address that with the bracketing, so you have that flexibility. Exactly. So, so that I can, like, if it is too dark, you know, when you take a picture, I'm always trying to recreate what my eyeball sees. You know, when you take a photograph you know, and you have contrast of super bright sky to super dark foreground or any sort of whatever you're shooting, even if it's at night with a bright light, um, our eyeball sees that better than the camera does. That's just, uh, maybe technology will catch up to that and it's starting to, but our, our computing system in our head is basically like, way more advanced than the cameras are these days. Um, that being said, I'm always trying to recreate that. So that's why I do auto bracket so that I can like, and when I edit an image, I'm always like, okay, what did that look like to me? And like, I remember, I try to always remember, you know, I have a photographic memory and I try to remember exactly like, you know, what it looked like to me. And then I try to recreate the image to what my eyeball saw, basically, if that makes sense. So yeah. I am usually shooting, you know, evening or, you know, super early morning, but sometimes I get the craziest images after the sun goes down. And then like, I'll bump my ISO up real crazy, real high and refocus for the foreground. And I'll be like, wow, that actually works better than the light that worked earlier because, you know, I can see a lot more contrast in the stuff that was dark, so. Yeah. Yeah, and this is this is definitely one of those styles of photography, you know, when you're traveling and, and you're finding these kind of remote locations where it can really turn into a good experience for, you know, kind of decompressing, you know, using it as also a way to just get away from all the stress that you may have. Even if there's, there's a couple um, uh, groups that I, I talk with where it's usually a lot of wedding photographers and portrait photographers that get burnt out really quick. And my biggest yeah. suggestion is if you've never done this kind of photography before, you know, take, take some time, go out, just, disappear from a bunch of places though do it safely make yeah. sure you can still connect to society but you know if, they, if you're into that that's fine but no it's it's like a really nice reset and that's why i like do like to seek out these places because like you know i'm not trying to share that i'm alone in this place or anything like that but it's just peaceful you know and you know whether i'm sharing it and you feel that it's peaceful that's great or not but if you feel peaceful when you're out there and you're like in a remote place and you can clear your head and forget about how many people there are in the world and stuff like that then it's good <laughs> yeah yeah <laughs> so this this uh, image I, I i would imagine this image is that kind of good example as to why why you bracket would would be my yes. you know view, viewing it because i i'd imagine at least from my experience as well this is a kind of image that 
a single shot is not going to do it justice. No, you know, like, I mean, and you won't, you know, a single shot exposed correctly just for the sky in the background, you know, it's not going to work out. So the, the, basically the rocks and the water, you might be able to see some reflection in the water, but you know, without bracketing on the tripod real quick. Also, like, I don't suggest for people to like go into snow ice caves that could collapse at any time, but <laughs> that's the point. But yeah, no, it's a really good example because you know, you could see some sort of light light on the snow up there up top, but without bracketing, then I wouldn't have been able to like actually get it to what my eyeball saw and, you know, actually show a lot more detail of the, the snow cave itself and the rocks in the bottom and the, the reflection in the water and stuff like that with having the proper exposure for, you know, the clouds and those mountains in the back. Yeah. And so is, is this in uh, Iceland as well, or is this somewhere else? This, this is in Switzerland. Switzerland, cool. Yeah, see, like like now now being being like in the, in that state where like at least since we're in the U.S., we're not allowed to travel to Europe now. <laughs> it's like, oh man, this this seeing images like this are a great way to kind of experience travel without actually being able to travel at the moment but it makes me so excited that when we can get back out to go to places like this and and just experience you know what what there is in in the world to go uh even for those like i know in the comments uh i think it was oh man who was it cliff uh one of our one of our regulars here who um has joined for a number of these sessions is actually out at yellowstone right now with his gh5 so oh, nice. I'm jealous, Cliff. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, man. Uh, Not that I live in an ugly place, but, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Very true. Yeah, you're, you're, you're up in the, the, the northeast, so, you know, you, you guys have some gorgeous country up there for, for beautiful yeah. images as well. Um, so Mark, uh, Mark's asking about with this shot, um, did you use any artificial lighting in this shot, or is this just multiple exposure? No. This was just like, okay, get in this ice cave. It, it, this is actually a snow cave. It's not even an ice cave. So like, I'm sure a few days after the whole thing collapsed or maybe later that afternoon, it was very unplanned, but you know, I set my tripod up before I went in there and then just went in there, had it all set up on auto bracket with a you know two second shutter delay, made sure I framed the shot correctly camera bam 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 auto bracketed you know ran out of there checked my exposures and like knowing my camera so well it was literally in and out in you know less than a minute and you know <laughs> nobody had to call anybody because <laughs> yeah because i made yeah. it up but no it, it was just the snow bridge just from like the winter snowfall from the eiger which is like basically behind me here and, you know, it's not advised to, you know, if anybody locally was there, they'd be like, what are you doing, crazy American? Get out of the snow cave. <laughs> so, yes, PSA for, for this session is while these images are incredibly beautiful, we do not condone people going out and putting yourselves in danger to capture images. <laughs> exactly. That's at your own risk. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> So, um, you know, with this is one of the images that they, that I was really excited to see because I get so many people questioning, you know, how, how do you do images like this? Can you walk us through the process of setting up, capturing this image, and then even maybe a little bit of what you do for post? Totally. So this image basically, you know, this was my set it and forget it camera, you know, um, and what I was doing was, you know, I'm like, okay, and you can see the light pollution. I know there's tons of, those are all planes, you know, and could have gone rigorously, you know, spent hours to get those plane lines out, but you know, that's ridiculous. So um, <laughs> I'm pretty sure this was shot on the G9 and I think with the 12 mil, uh, but this is, this mountain's the Monk and, you know, I know where the North Star is. So I shot towards the North Star and basically, you know, put the camera on time-lapse mode, make sure, put my focus beaking on, you know, quickly focused. This, this is like a two minute setup, you know, um, on a tripod, you know, put my, my 
my in-camera time-lapse mode on, you know, and made sure that I had less than a five second delay in between images. And that was like the most important thing to actually make the star trails not have gaps in them and be star trails. And then, you know, I proceeded to tell the camera to shoot like 4,000 pictures over, how, you know, two hours or something like that. And, uh, and then I walked away with the other camera and shot some other pictures. But uh, afterward, you know, bring it back onto the computer, you know, I, it's really a couple of quick moves in Photoshop to, you know, make a smart object and, you know, pick the stack mode of maximum, which is basically saying, you know, you're putting all these single exposures in layers on top of each other and then like saying, pull all the light out of them. So when you're saying, all these pictures, you know, they're all on a tripod. So, you know, there's 4,000 pictures and you're saying, pull the light out of all of them. And we're talking a dark night sky, you know, it basically creates the star trail. If that makes sense. Yeah. Yeah, yeah no, that's, that, that's awesome. So like in a situation like that with the, the mountain there in front, that does that naturally just kind of brighten up as you're magnifying or like multiplying that exposure, not multiplying as you're, you're, you're it, using it the, does, the filter. And like, you know, any sort of other ambient light or the moon or something could brighten it up too much. So sometimes I'll just like pick one image and, you know, quickly select and cut that out and then slap it back on. And then again, it's we're compositing the image, but it's, you know, all in a tripod. I'm not like changing, you know, the scene or the mountain. I didn't just slap that mountain there or anything. You know, it was yeah. actually there. So. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Every so, I mean, mountain in it, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you know, that's 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 that kind of core point of you know, with, with a lot of people is, you know, when you wanna do photography like this, having that sturdy, solid tripod for this stuff becomes so important. Like if 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 you shot this and you had four thousand images but then two thousand images in the tripod moved or the wind shook it or something it's like that that becomes just so disheartening at the end when you start putting it together and it's like oh, but now the mountains moved yeah. like five pixels and like this this was shot at like twelve thousand feet in like the middle of the night at like you know under zero degree weather you know and the camera without changing battery still fired off four thousand pictures and you know <laughs> No, so it's one of those no, again, like you said, knowing knowing your camera and like knowing how to operate it is so important. And like, it obviously it takes time to learn any camera system, but having like the flexibility of it being so easy is just like it's no brainer for me to go set this up and walk away with my other camera and play with focus stacking or you know. And I think I think I even got I like started getting really cold, so like I went back in the hut for a little while and like you know ate some food and then was like okay like. Wonder if the camera is frozen to death yet, you know? And I'd like walk back out, and I'm like, oh okay. no, it's still still shooting away. Like, okay, like, <laughs> it's like I right, guess we'll give it another sweet. hour and then come back, you know? <laughs> no, you know that's that's cool. And uh, so, like, some of the questions that people have been asking about this is, you know, uh, how long of an exposure? So, for the actual individual picture of of you know each image, how how long? would you run that exposure for? So with this lens, I think I was shooting about 15 second exposures with like a under five second gap before it took another exposure. Um, and by doing that, you know, there's something called a 500 rule, which, you know, divide focal length by 500 and you won't get star movement. Um, there's tons of YouTube videos out on that. And again, it's called the 500 rule. It works a little different for micro four thirds. Uh, so basically I do that because say there is like a single image in this that was really cool and you know maybe there's a shooting star or something and I wanted to use that single image I could use that single image without seeing a longer star trail and then also if I wanted to build this into like a time lapse or a moving time lapse you know to see the stars moving around I could also use all these images to create a time lapse with um, and then also create a single star trail image as well. So that being said, I could create all these different things by using my 500 rule and shooting it as a time lapse and then also being able to create it. There's just, in the end, there's like multiple different ways you can, you know, use what you've shot to create different things. So. 
Yeah. Yeah, and, and you know, just like you said, if, if it's ridiculously cold and you're out in the middle of nowhere trying to maximize the, the amount that you can get out of that image for those times when you look back at it, it's that's that's an important thing to think about as well. Um, totally. So a couple of the question, a couple of the other questions uh, about this image uh, was which camera did you use? I think you said you thought this was the G9. I believe this is the G9, and it it, it might even been that 15 mil 1.7, just because it's so such a small setup to carry around as the second camera, you know. Yeah, uh, and then when it comes to the actual image of of these, do you prefer to shoot RAW or JPEG or RAW plus JPEG? I mean, I always prefer to shoot raw and, you know, there's just so much more flexibility. And if I've got some giant card and I, you know, if, if you, you know, again, when you're processing 4,000 raw images, you know, you got to have a beat of a computer. So like, if you only have a little bit of RAM in your computer, I would suggest, you know, shooting in JPEG, but that's about the only reason I would suggest shooting in JPEG. Otherwise, always shoot in raw start in white balance you can start to learn about kelvin and you know what different ambient light or what you're trying to shoot like will affect your image but um yeah. i would say always raw always auto white balance for starting you know yeah no cool. flexibility in post to, to switch that around yeah definitely and and you know just just like you explained you know with a lot of this it it does take that that time to be able to put these images together when you want to you know, do that focus stacking or, you know, be able to correct an exposure shift that may have happened. It's, it's, it's totally definitely important to shoot in raw. Yeah. So yeah, looks like, I mean, only raw. <laughs> doesn't matter what you do. <laughs> Same here. It's, it's kind of just raw is always on and that's just what I use, you know? <laughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, sometimes when I know I'm getting it right and like, I know I'm just like, going to give the file to somebody in two seconds and there i know that like the light is perfect i'll shoot in raw and jpeg and then just shoot them the jpeg real quick yeah via phone app and see you later you know it's nice <laughs> to be able to wi-fi to the camera and send it on its way yeah definitely definitely so now, now see this the images like this i've i've always been drawn to try to recreate you know where you have that that beautiful reflection of the milky way the the great exposed foreground so with a shot like this what kind of planning goes into to creating an image like this for you um so and again like this one this was one of those cases where i'd planned to shoot the edelweiss and like you know the that that image we were looking at earlier with the edelweiss and the frog you know the frog was not planned also it just worked out and you know this was exploring a little later in the evening and uh you know this is a single exposure so like the cameras have gotten so good that like you can do it all in a single exposure i, I barely touched this up like two second touch up in an app and it's ready to go, you know, um, Wi-Fi to the phone. So this is like, you know, cameras obviously set up on a tripod on all my night stuff, but, you know, set for a 10 second delay. And then I ran over to the side and quickly light painted, you know, just these flowers and, and then quickly light painted into the, the mountainside there a little bit. I've got a couple of renditions of this image where you can kind of see those two dark spots in the middle a little bit better, but, you know, being able to shoot it all in one exposure, not mess with it afterwards, like goes a long way too, to, to not be putting like hours and hours of work into like post-processing. And I, I'm firm believer that <clears throat> the more I can get out and shoot and the more I'm out in the field, the happier I am. Like I want to be out in the wild and not sitting on the computer as long as I need to, you know, so that's, that's, <laughs> For me, that image is like, okay, like, camera settings are on, like, focus is on, like, you know, let's shoot a couple images, play with light painting real quick, and move on, you know? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> we're like, at, you know, this, this, and that's possible now because we're like at ISO 10,000, you know? Exactly, exactly. You know, the, I think regularly I've got my S1 or my S1H up at about... I think I'm usually like minimum 6,400 for shooting uh, anything that I'm doing in night night landscapes anymore. Cause it's like, it, it's yeah. just, it's so good now these days. And when I go back and I use my GH5S, 
you know, I, I'm comfortable going up to 12,800 for some of those shots, you know, are they a yeah. little noisier? Yeah, but it, it still like works great for, for the tool I have with me. Exactly. Exactly. You know, you can go out with the GH5S and like a, like a super small lens and, you know, carry wine keys and, you know, a yeah. blow up mattress and make yourself super comfortable. But like, you know, that's when you get into, should I bring another camera body? How, you know, learning around, learning and playing with all this stuff and then getting further out is like kind of how I've evolved through it. And, you know, I, I'm always preferring to be further away and, trying to see new things so it, it's just it's so fun to me to be able to go out and shoot stuff that you, you can't it's a completely different world in the in the dark you know yeah yeah definitely <laughs> so now now these these are also like i i i feel like i'm saying that on every image that comes up it's like now see this is a cool image because it's like <laughs> <laughs> seeing seeing how how drastically different every image can be even though even though it's the same sky you know it's 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 the same milky yep. way that, that we look at just all these different ways to to photograph it i mean a shot like this so how how was a shot like this lit for you um so you know that's that's actually my brother who lives in switzerland over there and uh you know, I've got my tent and he's got his tent set up here, but you know, it was literally with knowing my camera settings, knowing like the exposure for the sky, it was just a little bit of like compensation on the aperture and a quick light paint while he was just looking up with his headlamp to the sky and quick light paint on the rock in the front. He had a light set up in his tent and uh, yeah, it was, you know, super simple, not much crazy editing done or anything. and in and out of uh, Lightroom and done, you know. Um, it, it, once the camera was set up the, the way I knew it was working well for the sky, it was, you know, almost like kind of just moving the tripod around and having fun with it, you know. Yeah. No, that's, 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 that's like some of the, those cool, cool like kind of things that once, once you get comfortable with the base of how to capture the Milky Way, being able to add those other components becomes really like a, the fun side of it. You know, how is this going to look? Again, how, how do you do that? And again, I would be talking like, you know, how important it is to learn infinity, but like with focus peaking and the cameras now, like we're like, we have a cheat system that just like put it on focus peaking. And you, I mean, you can almost autofocus to any sort of bright star in the sky by zooming in live view and, auto focusing on it but you can focus <laughs> peak too make sure you're tack sharp and you know the the hard part's over you know yeah yeah cool so let's see what oh <laughs> that was cool loan cheap <laughs> <laughs> so th these so so with with images like this, I know, um, so there's there's definitely a lot of, comp at least from what I can see, it looks like there's a lot of compression in a shot like this. Yeah. So are, totally. are you, like, what what focal lengths do you use for, for that kind of look? This was at the, this was the 200 mil, maybe the 1 to 400 and or somewhere in between there. Um, as, I know it's out past 200, or I might have the 200 with the teleconverter on it, actually. Oh. Nice. And I, I mean, I enjoy shooting long or wide, you know, I mean, I do like in between, <laughs> but like, you know, if I'm going to be picky. <laughs> oh, man. And then, you know, Aurora is fun too. completely different set of like settings, way less of a, a longer 500 rule, you know, if you guys get into this and you look up the 500 rule, it's basically saying like how to not see star trails, but the Aurora is so bright, like the moon would be so bright that like you're talking way less of, of a longer exposure, like, you know, two to five seconds and five seconds past being like almost too long of an exposure. But again, this is a single exposed image with light painting in the foreground. See, that's 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 always one of the questions I had about you know photographing the aurora is 
you know, I, I imagined it was similar to capturing, you know, star tra- not capturing star trails, but actually photographing the Milky Way. So the the times are much shorter for that, you said? Much shorter because you're, you're like, your light source is so much stronger, you know? The, the light source of the aurora is like, you know, and when the aurora really picks up, it's like you, you can you can see the ground again and, you know, it's it's quite the experience. I, and it's hard to explain when you're in a crazy solar storm, but, and then there goes a lot into planning. Yeah, of course, too. Like we go through a 10 year solar cycle of basically when the aurora starts to get heavy or the magnetic, you know, at the the sun starts to have sunspots that actually make aurora happen a lot more frequently down below the northern latter northern and southern poles basically um but that being said you can always go to iceland you know after september to end of march and you know definitely see some aurora for sure if if they ever let us back there but <laughs> Hopefully. Ah, <laughs> <laughs> uh, good old, good old black, black diamond equipment. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and, yeah, I mean the wind. It's 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 so fun to camp there and stay there. And all these images are you know separate or single exposures, no focus stacking, and you know so like you can get like you know focus stack styled images just starting out and being able to light paint and play with light painting your foreground and still get like a really cool image without like doing all the craziness on the computer too. You know, this is straight out of camera. So. That's, that's, that's definitely a, a, a cool thing. I think with all the technology now is that, you know, obviously there's a lot of things that we've built into our cameras to assist this style of photography, but you know, being able to not have to deal with as much post-production, being able to get it right in camera and have to only make minor changes is is really that, that kind of sweet spot when you've really become comfortable with your equipment that you just know how it's going to react. And it definitely takes time, but it show, like like your your work shows when you have that control of the camera that you can really do just go out and focus on creating content instead of fiddling around with the, with the equipment. And then also worrying about like post or worrying about, you know, constant preview is just amazing. Like, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, what is it? Uh, uh, constant preview night mode and the red mode are like, like yeah. the core things for like, or no, and, and uh, uh, on the S series live view boost now, just make yeah, it exactly. so much easier to do this kind of shooting. <laughs> it's like, it's at first I was like, Oh, like all this stuff that I like had to learn so hard to like, <laughs> like teach a different way or, <clears throat> and even learn myself, you know, it's like, it's it doesn't even matter anymore. <laughs> it's which, cheating. We got, which is a good that. thing. No, it is a really good thing. And like, and, it, it's a really good thing because somebody that wants to get into this can get into this a lot quicker. And, you know, it, they're not like, oh, this is ridiculous. And, and it's way too hard to like figure out this, this, and this. It's like focus on, you know, like every everything that you had to think about before is kind of like, you know, given to you at your fingertips, which is pretty freaking awesome. Yeah, yeah definitely. Yeah, these 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 uh, uh, aurora shots. I, I I just love that kind of that feeling you get from it. You know, yeah. It's just it's mm-hmm. just so so totally different from like like down here in Texas. The, I I have no shot of seeing it anymore. When I lived in Jersey, no. there were a couple times where it was like, hey, if you go really far up north, maybe you'll see it. But definitely gonna yeah. have to make a trip up to your area and you know maybe you, out, have, you know please, overseas. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Please, let's. I'm ready. I- I don't, I don't think everybody else is ready, but. <laughs> oh, man. So this one's um, cool. I'm you, 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 were, you were telling me about, about this shot and, and with the way the farmers do. Um, can you give the, the viewers some kind yeah, of insight so, into this? 
so this is in Switzerland. Like the the great, there's like 45 degree pitch grade around everywhere, and you know the the fog here is from just fires in the springtime. The farmers like literally. I mean, you know how people have a, a gardener for their garden at home, and they have a guy who cuts the lawn. They do this like in the mountains all the way up to you know tree line, and they basically like snip all the trees perfectly. They burn all the brush to like make sure that there's everything looks immaculately perfect. You know, where you can't get a machine because it's so steep, they like cut the grass by hand and then rake it down so that they can put it in a barn for, for you know, the winter's hay for the sheep. I've got sheep here in Vermont, but I've got a small homestead here, but um, it, it's just like crazy how immaculate like they, keep the alp you know yeah no it, it, that's it, it's it's just so cool again you know coming from from the u.s not not seeing mountains like this not seeing you know just vistas like this so we we have some of it obviously you know the, the rockies and stuff like that but there's this this really especially now with with the limited ability to travel this really gives me that kind of like encouragement that you know once once we're back to where we can travel to really just you know actually seize the opportunities and go out and create you know i i think a lot of people get you know kind of caught up especially now in you know the kind of rut that you know can't go out can't really go out and and, and photograph a lot because of social distancing stuff like that but seeing a lot of your work I think can help a lot of people see that you know there's so many cool places to go and I know we've got a lot of people asking um you know questions in YouTube and some of the other platforms you know where where they can see more of your work um I know uh, <laughs> looks like Mark 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 Toll's monitoring our uh, questions for us today and uh, just dropped your website down into the chat but on uh, since we're we're at about an hour onto our stream um where can where can uh, uh, people find you uh, online, social media, I mean, and website? Instagram, Ben Gruno, just very simple. My name spelled out. Uh, and then Elmore Mountain Photo is like my Facebook page. Um, and then ElmoreMountainPhoto.com is my website. And those are like the those are my main platforms that I do use for for sharing images. Cool. Cool. So, um, like I said, unfortunately, we, we're, we're at the, the hour. Um, I know there was a ton that, um, you know, you, you and I were talking about before we went into uh, the stream today. And honestly, I could go on for another hour and talk. Um, <laughs> Me too. <laughs> Me too. <laughs> but, uh, but, no, yeah. thank you so much for having me. I really appreciate it. And I, yeah. and I hope all of you guys. I hope everybody gets out and like you know can make some moments and save them by taking images of it you know and yeah. if you do want to do the night photography like there there's it, it just gets more and more interesting as you learn and that you know if you do have any questions please reach out i'll do anything i can to help you know i've, I've got time so um please feel free to, <laughs> feel free to reach out if you have any questions my email is ben at elmoremountainphoto.com, all spelled out, um, E-L-M-O-R-E. -E. So, yeah. Yeah, and we'll, we'll uh, put that info down in the, um, the chat uh, after this so that everyone will be able to see the images, you know, kind of really, really get some inspiration from you. So um, with that, I want to, to let's see here. I want to thank uh, everybody. I want to thank Ben for, for joining in with us. Uh, I want to thank, again, uh, all of you for taking time out of your day to join us on this week's Lumix Live. Uh, we have a really exciting Lumix Live coming up next week, uh, so stay tuned for information on that one. Uh, I think it's going to be a, a really fun conversation with a couple of photographers. Uh, Remember that if you liked the information that you got here and you liked the the kind of setup that we've got going here, leave a comment down in the chat below. Uh, hit the like button so that you know we, we see that you guys are actually enjoying this. Uh, if you want to be notified for future Lumix Live events and you're subscribed to us, hit the bell icon. This way you get that notification. And if you're not subscribed, 
maybe try subscribing. Uh, you know, we put out a ton of content uh, between these Lumix lives of live events each week and a ton of informational content on new products that uh, have come out, uh, educational content for uh, new cameras as they come out as well. And be sure to check out Ben's uh, website, which again, we'll leave in the comments below. So you can follow him and see where he may be speaking next when we're back to normal activities in the stores and out there at trade shows. So again, thank you for joining us. Tune in next week and we'll see you next time.